The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 1, Section 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. Volume 1, Section 17. When it was the twenty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ajib's grandmother heard his words, she waxed wroth, and looked at the servant, and said, Woe to thee! Dost thou spoil my son, and dost take him into common cookshops? The eunuch was frightened, and denied, saying, We did not go into the shop, we only passed by it. By Allah, cried Ajib, but we did go in, and we ate till it came out of our nostrils, and the dish was better than thy dish. Then his grandmother rose and went and told her brother-in-law, who was incensed against the eunuch, and sending for him, asked him, Why didst thou take my son into a cook-shop? And the eunuch, being frightened, answered, We did not go in. But Ajib said, We did go inside, and ate conserve of pomegranate grains, till we were full, and the cook gave us to drink of iced and sugared sherbet. At this the wazir's indignation redoubled, and he questioned the castrato. But, as he still denied, the wazir said to him, If thou speak sooth, sit down and eat before us. So he came forward, and tried to eat, but could not eat, and threw away the mouthful, crying, O oh my lord, I am surfeited since yesterday. By this the wazir was certified that he had eaten at the cook's, and bade the slaves throw him, which they did. Then they came down on him with a rib-basting, which burnt him till he cried for mercy and help from Allah, saying, O oh my master, beat me no more, and I will tell thee the truth. Whereupon the wazir stopped the bastinado, and said, Now speak thou sooth. Quoth the eunuch, Know then that we did enter the shop of a cook, while he was dressing conserve of pomegranate grains, and he set some of it before us. By Allah, I never ate in my life its like, nor tasted aught nastier than this stuff which is now before us. Badr al-Din Hassan's mother was angry at this, and said, Needs thou must go back to the cook, and bring me a saucer of conserved pomegranate grains from that which is in his shop, and show it to thy master, that he may say which be the better and the nicer, mine or his. Said the unsexed, I will. So on the instant she gave him a saucer and a half dinar, and he returned to the shop and said to the cook, O Shaykh of all cooks, we have laid a wager concerning thy cookery in my lord's house, for they have conserve of pomegranate grains there also. So give me this half dinar's worth, and look to it, for I have eaten a full meal of stick on account of thy cookery, and so do not let me eat aught more thereof. Hassan of Basura laughed, and answered, By Allah, none can dress this dish as it should be dressed, save myself and my mother, and she at this time is in a far country. Then he ladled out a saucerful, and finishing it off with musk and rose-water, put it in a cloth which he sealed, and gave it to the eunuch, who hastened back with it. No sooner had Badr al-Din Hassan's mother tasted it, and perceived its fine flavour, and the excellence of the cookery, than she knew who had dressed it, and she screamed and fell down fainting. The wazir, sorely started, sprinkled rose-water upon her, and after a time she recovered, and said, if my son be yet of this world, none dressed this conserve of pomegranate grains but he, and this cook is my very son, Badr al-Din Hassan. There is no doubt of it, nor can there be any mistake, for only I and he knew how to prepare it, and I taught him. When the wazir heard her words, he joyed with exceeding joy, and said, Oh, the longing of me for a sight of my brother's son! I wonder if the days will ever unite us with him. Yet it is to Almighty Allah alone that we look for bringing about this meeting. Then he rose without stay or delay, and going to his suite said to them, Be off some fifty of you with sticks and staves to the cook-shop and demolish it. Then pinion his arms behind him with his own turban, saying, It was thou madest that foul mess of pomegranate grains. 
and drag him here perforce, but without doing him any harm. And they replied, It is well. Then the wazir rode off without losing an instant to the palace, and foregathering with the viceroy of Damascus, showed him the sultan's orders. After careful perusal he kissed the letter, and placing it upon his head, said to his visitor, Who is this offender of thine? Quoth the wazir, A man who is a cook. So the viceroy at once sent his apparitors to the shop, which they found demolished, and everything in it broken to pieces, for whilst the wazir was riding to the palace, his men had done his bidding. Then they awaited his return from the audience, and Hassan of Basura, who was their prisoner, kept saying, I wonder what they have found in the conserve of pomegranate grains to bring things to this pass. When the wazir returned to them, after his visit to the viceroy, who had given him formal permission to take up his debtor and depart with him, on entering the tents he called for the cook. They brought him forward, pinioned with his turband, and when Badr al-Din Hassan saw his uncle, he wept with excessive weeping, and said, O oh my lord, what is my offence against thee? Art thou the man who dressed that conserve of pomegranate grains? asked the wazir, and he answered, Yes. Didst thou find in it aught to call for the cutting off of my head? quoth the wazir, That were the least of thy deserts. quoth the cook, O oh my lord, will thou not tell me my crime, and what aileth the conserve of pomegranate grains? Presently, replied the wazir, and called aloud to his men, Bring hither the camels. So they struck the tents, and by the wazir's orders, the servants took Badr al-Din Hassan, and set him in a chest which they padlocked and put on a camel. Then they departed, and stinted not journeying till nightfall, when they halted, and ate some victual and took Badr al-Din Hassan out of his chest, and gave him a meal, and locked him up again. They set out once more, and travelled till they reached Kimra, where they took him out of the box, and brought him before the wazir, who asked him, Art thou he who dressed that conserve of pomegranate grains? He answered, Yes, O my lord. And the wazir said, Fetter him. So they fettered him, and returned him to the chest, and fared on again till they reached Cairo, and lighted at the quarter called ar Then the wazir gave order to take Badr al-Din Hassan out of the chest, and sent for a carpenter, and said to him, Make me a cross of wood for this fellow. Cried Badr al-Din Hassan, And what wilt thou do with it? And the wazir replied, I mean to crucify thee thereon, and nail thee thereto, and parade thee all about the city. And why wilt thou use me after this fashion? because of thy villainous cookery of conserved pomegranate grains. How durst thou dress it, and sell it lacking pepper? And for that it lacked pepper, wilt thou do all this to me? Is it not enough that thou hast broken my shop, and smashed my gear, and boxed me up in a chest, and fed me only once a day? Too little pepper! Too little pepper! This is a crime which can be expiated only upon the cross. Then Badr al-Din Hassan marvelled, and fell a mourning for his life whereupon the wazir asked him, Of what thinkest thou? And he answered him, Of maggoty heads like thine, for an thou had one ounce of sense, thou hadst not treated me thus. Quoth the wazir, It is our duty to punish thee, lest thou do the like again. Quoth Badr al-Din Hassan, Of a truth my offence were over-punished by the least of what thou hast already done to me and Allah damn all conserve of pomegranate grains, and curse the hour when I cooked it, and would I had died ere this. But the wazir rejoined, There is no help for it. I must crucify a man who sells conserve of pomegranate grains lacking pepper. All this time the carpenter was shaping the wood, and Badr al looked on, and thus they did till night, when his uncle took him and clapped him into the chest, saying, The thing shall be done to-morrow. Then he waited until he knew Badr al-Din Hassan to be asleep, when he mounted, and taking the chest up before him, entered the city, and rode on to his own house, where he alighted, and said to his daughter Sitt al-Khust, Praised be Allah, who hath reunited thee with thy husband, the son of thine uncle. Up now, and order the house as it was on thy bridal night. So the servants arose, and lit the candles, and the wazir took out his plan of the nuptial chamber, 
and directed them what to do till they had set everything in its stead, so that whoever saw it would have no doubt but that it was the very night of the marriage. Then he bade them put down Badr ad-Din Hassan's turban on the settle, as he had deposited it with his own hand, and in like manner his bag trousers and the purse which were under the mattress, and told his daughter to undress herself and go to bed in the private chamber as on her wedding night, adding, When the son of thine uncle comes into thee, say to him, Thou hast loitered while going to the privy, and call him to lie by thy side, and keep him in converse till daybreak when we will explain the whole matter to him. Then he bade take Badr ad-Din Hassan out of the chest, after loosing the fetters from his feet, and stripping off all that was on him, save the fine shirt of blue silk, in which he had slept on his wedding night, so that he was well-nigh naked and trouserless. All this was done whilst he was sleeping on, utterly unconscious. Then, by doom of destiny, Badr ad-Din Hassan turned over and awoke, and finding himself in a lighted vestibule, said to himself, Surely I am in the mazes of some dream. So he rose, and went on a little to an inner door, and looked in, and lo, he was in the very chamber wherein the bride had been displayed to him, and there he saw the bridal alcove, and the settle, and his turban, and all his clothes. When he saw this, he was confounded, and kept advancing with one foot, and retiring with the other, saying, Am I sleeping or waking? and he began rubbing his forehead, and saying, for indeed he was thoroughly astounded, By Allah! Verily, this is the chamber of the bride who was displayed before me. Where am I then? I was surely but now in a box. Whilst he was talking with himself, Zit al Husn suddenly lifted the corner of the chamber curtain, and said, O my lord, wilt thou not come in? Indeed thou hast loitered long in the water-closet. When he heard her words, and saw her face, he burst out laughing, and said, Of a truth, this is a very nightmare among dreams. Then he went in, sighing, and pondered what had come to pass with him, and was perplexed about his case, and his affair became yet more obscure to him, when he saw his turban and bag trousers, and when, feeling the pocket, he found the purse containing the thousand gold pieces. So he stood still, and muttered, Allah is all-knowing! Assuredly, I am dreaming a wild, waking dream. Then said the Lady of Beauty to him, What ails thee to look puzzled and perplexed? Adding, Thou wast a very different man during the first of the night. He laughed, and asked her, How long have I been away from thee? And she answered him, Allah preserve thee, and his holy name be about thee. Thou didst but go out an hour ago for an occasion, and return. Are thy wits clean gone? When Badr ad-Din Hassan heard this, he laughed, and said, Thou hast spoken truth, but when I went out from thee I forgot myself a while in the draught-house, and dreamt that I was a cook at Damascus, and abode there ten years, and there came to me a boy who was of the sons of the great, and with him a eunuch. Here he passed his hand over his forehead, and feeling the scar, cried, By Allah, O my lady, it must have been true, for he struck my forehead with a stone, and cut it open from eyebrow to eyebrow, and here is the mark, so it must have been on wake. Then he added, But perhaps I dreamt it when we fell asleep, I and thou, in each other's arms, for me seems it was as though I travelled to Damascus without tarbush and trousers, and set up as a cook there. Then he was perplexed and considered for a while, and said, By Allah, I also fancied that I dressed a conserve of pomegranate grains, and put too little pepper in it. By Allah, I must have slept in the numerocent, and have seen the whole thing in a dream. But how long was that dream? Allah upon thee, said Sitt al Hust, and what more sawest thou? So he related all to her, and presently said, by Allah, had I not woke up, they would have nailed me to a cross of wood. Wherefore? asked she, and he answered, For putting too little pepper in the conserve of pomegranate grains, and meseemed they demolished my shop, and dashed to pieces my pots and pans, destroyed all my stuff, and put me in a box. They then sent for the carpenter to fashion a cross for me, and would have crucified me thereon. Now, alhamdulillah, thanks be to Allah, for that all this happened to me in sleep, and not on wake. Sitt al Khus laughed, and clasped him to her bosom, and he her to his. Then he thought again, and said, 
by allah it could not be save while i was awake truly i know not what to think of it then he lay him down and all the night he was bewildered about his case now saying i was dreaming and then saying i was awake till morning when his uncle shams ad-din the wazir came to him and saluted him when badr ad-din hasan saw him he said by allah art thou not he who bade bind my hands behind me and smash my shop and nail me to a cross on a matter of conserved pomegranate grains because the dish lacked a sufficiency of pepper whereupon the wazir said to him know o my son that truth hath shown it sooth fast and the concealed hath been revealed thou art the son of my brother and i did all this with thee to certify myself that thou wast indeed he who went in unto my daughter that night i could not be sure of this till i saw that thou knewest the chamber and thy turban and thy trousers and thy gold and the papers in thy writing and in that of thy father my brother for i had never seen thee afore that and knew thee not and as to thy mother i have prevailed upon her to come with me from bassora so saying he threw himself on his nephew's breast and wept for joy and badr ad-din hasan hearing these words from his uncle marvelled with exceeding marvel and fell on his neck and also shed tears for excess of delight then said the wazir to him o oh my son the sole cause of all this is what passed between me and thy sire and all that had occurred to part them lastly the wazir sent for ajib and when his father saw him he cried and this is he who struck me with the stone quoth the wazir this is thy son and badr ad-din hasan threw himself upon his boy and began repeating long have i wept to a severance ban and bane long from mine eyelids tearils rail and rain and vowed i if time reunion bring my tongue from name of severance i'll restrain joy hath o'ercome me to this stress that i from joy's revulsion to shed tears am fain ye are so trained to tears o eyne of me you weep with pleasure as you weep with pain when he had ended his verse his mother came in and threw herself upon him and began reciting when we met we complained our hearts were sore wrung but plaint is not pleasant for a messenger's tongue then she wept and related to him what had befallen her since his departure and he told her what he had suffered and they thanked allah almighty for their reunion Two days after his arrival the wazir shams ad-din went in to the sultan and kissing the ground between his hands greeted him with the greeting due to kings the sultan rejoiced at his return and his face brightened and placing him hard by his side asked him to relate all he had seen in his wayfaring and what so had betided him in his going and coming so the wazir told him all that had passed from first to last and the sultan said thanks be to allah for thy victory and the winning of thy wish and thy safe return to thy children and thy people and now i needs must see the son of thy brother hasan of bassorah so bring him to the audience hall to-morrow shams ad-din replied thy slave shall stand in thy presence to-morrow inshallah if it be god's will then he saluted him and returning to his own house informed his nephew of the sultan's desire to see him whereto replied hasan while on the bassorite the slave is obedient to the orders of his lord and the result was that next day he accompanied his uncle shams ad-din to the divan and after saluting the sultan and doing him reverence in most ceremonious obeisance and with most courtly obsequiousness he began improvising these verses the first in rank to kiss the ground shall deign before you and all ends and aims attain you are honour's fount and all that hope of you shall gain more honour than hope hope to gain the sultan smiled and signed to him to sit down so he took a seat close to his uncle shams ad-din and the king asked him his name quoth badr ad-din hasan the meanest of thy slaves is known as hasan the bassorite who is instant in prayer for thee day and night the sultan was pleased at his words and being minded to test his learning and prove his good breeding asked him 
Dost thou remember any verses in praise of the mole on the cheek? He answered, I do, and began reciting, When I think of my love and our parting smart, My groans go forth and my tears upstart. He's a mole that reminds me in colour and charms of the black of the eye and the grain of the heart. The king admired and praised the two couplets and said to him, Quote something else, Allah bless thy sire, and may thy tongue never tire. So he began, That cheek mole spot they evened with a grain of musk, nor did they hear the simile strain. Nay, marvel at the face comprising all beauty, nor falling short by single grain. The king shook with pleasure, and said to him, Say more, Allah bless thy days. So he began, O you, whose mole on cheek enthroned recalls a dot of musk upon a stone of ruby. Grant me your favours, be not stone at heart, core of my heart, whose only sustenance you be. Quoth the king, Fair comparison, O Hassan, thou hast spoken excellently well, and hast proved thyself accomplished in every accomplishment. Now explain to me how many meanings be there in the Arabic language for the word khal or mole. He replied, Allah keep the king, seven and fifty, and some by tradition say fifty. Said the sultan, Thou sayest sooth, presently adding, Hast thou knowledge as to the points of excellence in beauty? Yes, answered Badr ad-Din Hassan. Beauty consisteth in brightness of face, clearness of complexion, shapeliness of nose, gentleness of eyes, sweetness of mouth, cleverness of speech, slenderness of shape, and seemliness of all attributes. But the acme of beauty is in the hair, and indeed Ashirab the Hijazi hath brought together all these items in his doggerel verse of the Mita Rajaz, and it is this. Say thou to skin, be soft, to face, be fair, and gaze, nor shall they blame how so thou stare. Fine nose in beauty's list is high esteemed, nor less an eye full, bright, and debonair. Eke did they well to lord the lovely lips, which e'en the sleep of me will never spare, a winning tongue, a stature tall and straight, a seemly union of gifts, rarest rare, but beauty's acme in the hair one views it, so hear my strain, and with some few excuse it. The sultan was captivated by his converse, and, regarding him as a friend, asked, What meaning is there in the saw, sure I is foxier than the fox? And he answered, Know, O king, whom almighty Allah keep, that the legist, Shiraich, was wont during the days of the plague to make a visitation to An-Najaf, and whenever he stood up to pray, there came a fox which would plant himself facing him, and which, by mimicking his movements, distracted him from his devotions. Now when this became longsome to him, one day he doffed his shirt and set it upon a cane, and shook out the sleeves, then, placing his turban on the top, and girding its middle with a shawl, he stuck it up in the place where he used to pray. Presently up trotted the fox, according to his custom, and stood over against the figure, whereupon Shuraich came up behind him and took him. Hence the sayer saith, Shuraich, foxier than the fox. When the sultan heard Badr ad-Din Hassan's explanation, he said to his uncle Shams ad -Din, Truly this, the son of thy brother, is perfect in courtly breeding, and I do not think that his like can be found in Cairo. At this Hassan arose, and kissed the ground before him, and sat down again as a mameluk should sit before his master. When the sultan had thus assured himself of his courtly breeding and bearing, and his knowledge of the liberal arts and belles-lettres, he joyed with exceeding joy, and invested him with a splendid robe of honour, and promoted him to an office whereby he might better his condition. Then Badr ad-Din Hassan arose, and kissing the ground before the king, wished him continuance of glory, and asked leave to retire with his uncle, the wazir Shams ad-Din. The sultan gave him leave, and he issued forth, and the two returned home, where food was set before them, and they ate what Allah had given them. 
After finishing his meal, Hassan repaired to the sitting-chamber of his wife, the Lady of Beauty, and told her what had passed between him and the Sultan, whereupon quoth she, He cannot fail to make thee a cup companion, and give thee largesse in excess, and load thee with favours and bounties. So shalt thou, by Allah's blessing, dispread like the greater light the rays of thy perfection, wherever thou be, on shore or on sea. Said he to her, I purpose to recite a Kasida, an ode in his praise, that he may redouble in affection for me. Thou art right in thine intent, she answered, so gather thy wits together, and weigh thy words, and I shall surely see my husband favoured with his highest favour. Thereupon Hassan shut himself up, and composed these couplets on a solid base, and abounding in inner grace, and copied them out in a handwriting of the nicest taste. They are as follows. Mine is a chief who reached most haught estate, treading the pathways of the good and great. His justice makes all regions safe and sure, and against froward foes bars every gate. Bold lion, hero, saint, e'en if you call, seraph or sovereign, he with all may rate. The poorest supplicant, rich from him returns, all words to praise him were inadequate. He to the day of peace is saffron morn, and murky night in furious warfare's bait. Bow neath his gifts our necks, and by his deeds, as king of freeborn souls, he joys his state. Allah increase for us his term of years, and from his lot avert all risks and fears. When he had finished transcribing the lines, he dispatched them, in charge of one of his uncle's slaves, to the sultan, who perused them, and his fancy was pleased, so that he read them to those present, and all praised them with the highest praise. Thereupon he sent for the writer to his sitting-chamber, and said to him, Thou art from this day forth my boon-companion, and I appoint to thee a monthly sold of a thousand dirhams, over and above that I bestowed on thee aforetime. So Hassan rose, and kissing the ground before the king several times, prayed for the continuance of his greatness and glory, and length of life and strength. Thus Badr ad-Din Hassan the Basorite waxed high in honour, and his fame flew forth to many regions, and he abode in all comfort and solace and delight of life, with his uncle and his own folk, till death overtook him. When the caliph Harun al-Rashid heard this story from the mouth of his wazir, Ja'afar the Barmicide, he marvelled much, and said, It behoves that these stories be written in letters of liquid gold. Then he set the slave at liberty, and assigned to the youth who had slain his wife such a monthly stipend as sufficed to make his life easy. He also gave him a concubine from amongst his own slave-girls, and the young man became one of his cup-companions. Yet this story, continued Shahrazad, is in no wise stranger than the tale of the tailor, and the hunchback, and the Jew, and the reeve, and the Nazarene, and what betided them quoth the king, and what may that be? So Shahrazad began in these words. The Hunchback's Tale It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that there dwelt during times of yore, and years and ages long gone before, in a certain city of China, a tailor who was an open-handed man that loved pleasuring and merry-making, and who was wont, he and his wife, to solace themselves from time to time with public diversions and amusements. One day they went out with the first of the light, and were returning in the evening, when they fell in with a hunchback, whose semblance would draw a laugh from care, and dispel the horrors of despair. So they went up to enjoy looking at him, and invited him to go home with them, and converse and carouse with them that night. He consented, and accompanied them afoot to their home, whereupon the tailor fared forth to the bazaar, night having just set in, and bought a fried fish, and bread, and lemons, and dry sweetmeats for dessert, and set the victuals before the hunchback, and they ate. Presently the tailor's wife took a great fid of fish, and gave it in a gobbet to the gobbo, stopping his mouth with her hand, and saying, By Allah, thou must down with it at a single gulp, and I will not give thee time to chew it. 
So he bolted it, but therein was a stiff bone which stuck in his gullet, and his hour being come, he died. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 17 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 1